Welcome, ladies and gents. Chris Andre here. You can find me at BetBoxing on Twitter. Of course, you can subscribe to the channel. Got two very special guests today. We've got two brilliant boxing channels that you really need to check out. One of them is Boxing on the Edge. A lot of sort of technical videos. It shows a lot of techniques. If you guys are interested in that sort of thing, you definitely need to check it out. We've also got Outmatch Boxing. Outmatch does a lot of uh, technical pre uh, breakdowns as well, previews of fights and things like that. Two brilliant guys that you really need to check out. Two members of the Boxing Brotherhood, as Hatman has referred to us, and I'm delighted to have them both on today. How are you, gentlemen? Are you all right? Yeah, good, man. Good. Thank you for having Very me. Very good, thanks. It's good great. to be here. Great, great. It's great to have you both. Let's get cracking. Let's talk boxing. Let's start off with Anthony Joshua. He's recently given an interview whereby he spoke about how he felt that he had to approach the Alexander Usyk fight as a boxing match, essentially, because he wanted to dismiss the myth that he's this big stiff idiot as he called it which is a phrase from Tyson Fury do you believe that that perhaps betrays a level of mental weakness is he concerned about what other people think or is it instead uh, more of a sign of the fact that he's looking to to achieve greatness and what he ultimately wants to do is dispel any such myth so that he can establish himself in the pantheon of great heavyweights. We'll start off with Outmatch. So, thank you, Chris, first and foremost. Um, regarding this interview, I've, I found it very interesting. It's only a two-minute interview, I believe, the clip itself. I've watched it multiple times since it published. And when it comes to Joshua, I find him to be a strange kind of enigma at times. But regarding what he said about boxing Usyk, and obviously that's what he attempted to do in the first fight and, and failed. Um, I don't entirely discount it because I do believe there is a part of Joshua who has taken on board these criticisms about being a bodybuilder, maybe just being a puncher and a big man. And he does um, actually want to show he has got skill because any objective boxing fan can see that he does. He's actually quite an underrated boxer. Uh, technique-wise, tactic-wise. Um, and I feel like he's taken on board these criticisms and he understands that he needs to go to another level. And Joshua strikes me, and I'm sure many other people, as someone who is only ever interested in getting better. However, I do feel like there are some demons left from the Andy Ruiz loss. So I, if anything, I'd say, just based on what I've observed, that it's those demons which are kind of the uh, the main reason as to why he's trying to go this route of of boxing 12 rounds, let's say, especially against a master boxer like Usyk. I feel like that is the primary reason, but I think it'd be unrealistic for him to, or to expect him to admit that on camera. So I think even though it is valid and it is true, I believe that that uh, notion of him just wanting to show that he can box. I just think that's uh, a bit more of a surface level reason. I believe that the deeper reason is because his confidence still isn't where it once was prior to the Andy Ruiz fight. Um, just my assessment, but you know, that's, that's what I see to be honest. And boxing on the edge, do you agree with that? And if so, do you consider it to actually be a strength though? If, if, because of course, if there are underlying demons there, he has to slay those demons. But do you think it's a strength in terms of the seeking to establish a legacy to want to be able to silence every single critic? Or do you think he'd be better off just doing what he does best and always just recognize that there are going to be critics there, whatever happens? Well, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me on. Appreciate it, Chris. Um, yeah, I do. I do agree. I think he's definitely got the demons um, for sure, but I think he just seems to like want to appease everybody else. And I, I think he does want to go for the legacy for sure for himself, but somewhere in, in the midst of, in the last few years, he's just been listening to so many different heads, different trainers. He's been in America listening to all these guys. He's got what, a team of five or six people. He It just sounds like he's just a little confused between different opinions and he's just I don't know he just seems like he's just trying to appease so many different people he just seems a bit confused with um his style stylistically for sure but I think he does want to you know go for that legacy that interview definitely seemed a little bit more genuine than a lot that I've seen because he can't he can, can be all over the place sometimes but 
it, it's it's interesting. I don't know. He's he's quite a hard person to read sometimes. But... Well, it's interesting that you say that because uh, he put out a quote as well today um, to say, I've been based in Sheffield and had a good chat with my coach. I want to try some new things, a new environment to get inspired again and take the heavyweight division by storm. New environment, work with some new coaches and go to war. It's a warrior mindset. Now, we've seen him move around the US, trialing different coaches. Um, we've seen him working with Coach Wilson in Dubai. More recently, we've seen him working with Lawrence O'Colley as well. We'll get to that in yeah. a moment. But in terms of this trying to dip his fingers into multiple pies. Do you see that as him absorbing as much information as possible, which could help him? Or is it going to be a case of too many cooks spoiling the broth, too much information perhaps being confusing? Does it show a level of uncertainty about who he is and what he offers? And uh, could that be a detriment? How do you envisage that? I, I think it's too many cooks in the kitchen, mate, to be honest. It, it, it seems like that um you know early on in his career he just said you know just come out and guns blazing and blasting people out obviously fights got more complicated but in the last couple of years he just seems torn between styles and like i said different uh his, his team you know robert mccracken and going to america it just it just you know and all these guys too that he's getting all these different information from will have different opinions they all, they might not be wrong or right but it might not be the right fit for him so he's getting told all this stuff oh yeah do this yeah, even if uh you see that uh video with floyd him and floyd where he was just hitting the bag he's probably getting told stuff from him so it's he was like, clearly listening to floyd floyd was telling yeah. him something so he's receiving no, definitely, instruction definitely but it's like what what I, I don't know what he must believe because he's getting told everything i just feel like he's got to listen to himself a bit more he's just trying to appease everybody else including the fans too you know like where they said you know he was in that interview he was mentioned about where well, he wanted to prove he wasn't just this big bodybuilder so he's basing his tactics and style off of what basically the boxing community or fans were saying which is a dangerous thing to do outmatch yeah. um I'll be honest with you, with me personally, I don't believe Anthony Joshua can win the fight if he takes on one approach. For me personally, the tactics he needs to employ is not actually to chase down Usyk and try and put it on him like a lot of people seem to be feeling. For me personally, I, when I did my own technical breakdown uh, for the preview of the fight, I showed various clips of Alexander Usyk when he is up against Tony Bellew, when he's sort of lured in, when he's the one forced to make the play. Uh, yeah. He can be lured into certain shots. And you saw it as well when Anthony Joshua did seem to hurt him on one occasion. AJ had quite a good base beneath him. He wasn't leaning back too much, getting off of balance. But he was luring him in, walked him onto a right hand. He was then unable to capitalise. I'd want to see that along with a mix of when he's luring him in to then change that sort of dynamic and go in closer, try and break his construct, work on the inside. Basically, a mixture of being a patient fighter with being a... A, a monster on the inside who's going to use his size to, to mix it up. I don't believe he can win it in one way. So my question to you, Outmatch, is this. If he is going to these various coaches and picking up these different sort of tidbits from each guy, is that because he feels that Alexander Usyk is so varied that he needs to pick up different elements of knowledge from different guys to try and create a mishmash, almost like picking up ingredients and, and trying to create this perfect recipe? Or... Do you believe that it's just a case of AJ searching for something that he feels is missing? So <laughs> I'm not going to try and pretend that there's any one answer or any simple answer. But personally, what I, I think is that based on what we saw in the first fight, um, I actually detailed this in my pre-fight video for that fight. I mean, I, I did loads of videos. I was, I was buzzing for that fight. Um, in my pre-fight video and one of my post-fight studies, I basically outlined that Joshua, I feel like he understands what Usyk is doing, but he just, he's not experienced to understand it at a quick enough rate to, um, to combat it effectively. And that's why we saw in certain spots, uh, he was able to have success because he was able to catch on and his brain was like, okay, I've seen this before in one of the earlier rounds. Um, this is how I'm going to counter it but I feel like with AJ um, the the core problem I want to say is the lack of experience because just to go back to the whole trainer situation um, I, I think AJ he's a bit lost right now because 
when I saw that interview, the first thing I thought was that saying from uh, that quote from Bruce Lee uh, about uh, taking what is useful, discard what is not and add what is uniquely your own. But how does one in any endeavor, any sport know what is effective? You, you take it in, you go out and you test it, you go out and you have your own experience and you, you see if it works for you, you see if it works um, at all. But I think because AJ, he's, he's really been in the fast lane his entire career, he's not exactly, he hasn't had the experience or enough experience to really test certain techniques. And I feel like what we see in boxing is sometimes you get fighters and they don't necessarily understand the techniques uh, they're trying to apply. And it all goes tits up, for lack of a better term. And then they discard with this or particular techniques or particular philosophy when it comes to fighting. And it, it, that could have been the thing that saved them. It could have been the thing that took them to another level. But because they had this bad experience with it, they don't, um, they don't take it any further. And I feel in other like... Words, in other words, what you're saying, sorry to cut you off there, you feel no. as though, despite being a unified champion, he's learning on the job, essentially. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I feel like he... He, he, yeah he is he's learning on the job and that's what makes it so impressive to be objective you know you have to give him credit because this is someone who what started boxing approximately 15 years ago and he's gone on to have what most people would say is the best resume in the division i'd concur that to be honest um and yeah you mean heavy heavyweight resume i think overall resume it has to go to usik i think personally if we're going to conclude some of the names he's got at cruiserweight, but at heavyweight, and do you think do you think AJ's CV is even better than Usyk's then in terms of name for name? Um, well, maybe if you do. I'm, I'm not... just heavyweights. I'd say I'd say Joshua. Yeah, yeah, just heavyweights. Okay. Um, Boxing on the edge. Let me ask you this: He's been doing a. Yeah. It, there's been a video doing the rounds of him training with Lawrence Ocoli. Yeah. Uh, you see him working on a couple of different things. First and foremost, you see them both use it when Ocoli starts to use lateral movement. Anthony Joshua first meets him with that same lateral movement. Now, I guess the idea behind this is that when Alexander Usyk starts to slip side to side, he will slip a shot and then come down with a shot down the pipe or a shot on the outside, but he's looking for that stationary target. So maybe AJ's trying to offer that movement as well to try and get Usyk to have to plant more to let go mm. of his shots. You then see them come together in the clinch and he's working on getting shots underneath the arms of Lawrence Okoli. Now, as somebody who does a lot of, videos on boxing techniques such as yourself mm. what do you make of the these sort of uh methods of working that aj's bringing in do you think these are things that could potentially help are they situations which could actually be more tiring for aj if aj's looking to employ a lot more upper body movement a lot more fluidity it's going to be more draining so although it might make him a harder target to hit it will also wear out that gas tank and we saw how exhausted he was at the end of the fight do you like what you're seeing or would you be wanting them to approach something different from a technique perspective? Well, I mean, well, the video was about a minute long, wasn't it? The, the first half, it looked like, well, he was going backwards. So it looked like a defensive sort of strategy to a degree where he was, you know, he was doing the lateral movement. Um, when I first thought, it, I th I, when I first saw it, I thought maybe he was, trying to use it to maybe buy a bit of time because when, when you say draining the energy, I don't necessarily totally agree with that because when, when he was standing there trying to box with Usyk, you know, he's using a lot of mental stamina. So like that can be almost more draining trying to match Usyk with this thought process going on and his balance was a little off and he's getting the timing all wrong. That can be a little draining itself. So I was like, when he's when he's moving backwards, I mean, is he going to try to 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 fight Usyk on the back foot? Is he trying to buy time by just being a little defensive? Maybe, but um, when he was doing the stuff on the inside in the second half of the video, I was I was thinking, well, you have to Usyk has to allow him to do that as well. You know, it takes two to really fight on the inside. I mean, you, you can't properly force it. Someone has to stay there in the pocket with you. So, and Usyk's better off in the mid-range, you know, coming in and out. So I can't see him getting sucked into a fight on the inside with AJ. He's, a, you know, smaller dude. Um, so I, I didn't see 
it been that advantageous if he deployed both of those things personally but you know i could be wrong but it didn't seem like it would do him any favors maybe Obviously, you're both entitled to change your predictions closer to the fight. I'm sure we're all going to swing in roundabouts when we see different things that are going to be occurring from now till then. How do you think this fight's going to go um, in terms of outcome? Who will win and by what method? I'll start off with uh, Boxing on the Edge. I think I think Usyk is going to stop AJ. If I was to make a prediction right now, I think AJ is going to apply a bit more pressure than he did. Uh, exerting a bit more energy. Usyk being a smarter boxer, highly intelligent. You know, he's only going to add to that. Um, he's going to be more confident if that's even possible. He's he's going to understand the rhythm. Um, and I think AJ is going to probably try and not empty the tank, but I can't see him just sit, sitting there and boxing and he's not, he's, he's not going to try and fight him on the back foot, I don't think. So he's going to have to take a few more risks, which would leave him a bit more open and I think perhaps, you know, a mid to late stop it. Well, not mid, but maybe like a late stoppage for Usyk, I would say. Outmatch? Uh, I have to go with repeat. I'm not sure if I will, I'm confident enough to go for a stoppage, but I, I can certainly imagine it happening. I'd go on points just because I feel like there may be... Um, maybe in the first fight, there was a bit of element of surprise that worked in Usyk's favour. However, um, I would be, I'm fairly confident that Usyk does the same again. I mean, he he really got off to a running start in the first fight. Uh, and I remember uh, outlining that uh, if Usyk is able to get onto the outside of Joshua's lead hand, then from there, the fight would be pretty much game over for Joshua. And Usyk was able to do it within like the first three seconds. So... I think a lot of people are actually underestimating uh, how better, how much better Usyk might be. They're always talking about Joshua and what he can do different and what he can do better. Yeah. Maybe Usyk can do even better too, you know? So, but really? yes. Yeah. Well, it's a terrific fight. I'm sure it's one that everybody's looking forward to. Let's move on to the next topic I want to discuss. Kiko Martinez is going to be fighting Josh Warrington. The fight has been announced. I was personally surprised that Kid Galahad did not invoke the rematch clause that he was entitled to invoke. Um, Rumours are that he's choosing to move up a weight category instead. Um, what is your opinion of Kid Galahad's choice, first and foremost? Secondly, Kiko Martinez and Warrington, is that a fight you're really excited about? A lot of people felt that the, the Warrington-Lara rematch would have ended up the same way. I actually had it 1-1 at the point. Obviously, it was only two rounds. I thought Warrington started the round, the first round very well. In the second round, there were some worrying moments again where he started to hold the pocket and punch with Lara again. Um, and if I had to guess, things were, were looking a little bit worrying for Warrington unless he would have been able to, to readapt and go back to what he was doing in the first round. The majority of people seem to feel that way, that perhaps Lara would have had his number again. If you were to choose, would you have rather have seen Kiko against Lara or Kiko against Warrington? Outmatch. Um, for me, it would have had to be Kiko versus Lara just because I feel like yeah, I'm not a massive fan of like all the rematches all the time, to be honest. But I have to, you know, preface that by saying I understand 100% logistically why Warrington versus Kiko is happening. Um, but yeah, for me, just the stylistic matchup uh, of Kiko and Lara. And I feel, I feel like it just makes for a bit more of an entertaining clash because I don't know about you guys, but I was only really tuning in uh, to Warrington versus Lara 2 to see Lara turn Warrington into a piñata again, to be honest. <laughs> so you're not a Warrington fan then, I think it's fair to yeah, assume. Yeah, I'd agree with that, <laughs> to be honest. Okay, so so do you think that Warrington? Oh uh, no, I'm I'm just I'm just bloodthirsty, that's all. <laughs> do, do you think Warrington is washed um, up then? I don't think Warrington Warrington's washed up. I just feel like he had like a good little run against Selby and Frampton, but without really knowing what he did right, I feel like he just had the style to overwhelm them. Selby, he doesn't really have much to keep off a, a high volume, high energy fighter like Warrington, other than the movement. Um, and then Frampton, had Frampton seen better days? I think so. And Frampton's a sharpshooter. He's not always going to be the guy who 
is going to out punch you or something and sometimes those sharpshooter guys they can be put in their shell because they, they spend so long trying to look for that ultra ultra precise shot but before they know it the uh the high volume guys just outworking them um and you know warrington he's an overachiever he's got great energy a lot of heart uh, a, a lot of heart um and you know great work rate but there's not really much culture to his work he doesn't really have the greatest technique he's not a puncher tactically mm, i don't think there's much there and he just came up against someone who that style doesn't work against boxing honest. on the edge would you how would you have seen a, a kiko martinez against lara fight going They're both, both big punches and that would have been exciting that definitely would have been a fight i'd have preferred to see bit more curious about Lara too. I didn't really know much about him prior to the Warrington first fight. And that would have been an interesting, interesting, you know, he's Mexican, right, Lara? And yeah. Martino's Spanish. Yeah, that would have been a good dust up. I'd, I'd have preferred to see that fight, to be honest. So, In terms of um, uh, Josh Warrington and British boxing, though, he brings a terrific... Uh, support behind him, the Leeds fans really yeah. turn up and they create a fantastic atmosphere. It would be a bitter blow for British boxing if Warrington was to lose to Kiko Martinez. I think we could all we could all accept that. We could all agree with that. If he does win it, let's say he wins it, he takes the title and uh, he's in a in a position to move on. Where do you think they would take him? I mean, the Kid Galahad rematch was always something that was spoken about, but clearly, if if Kid Galahad is moving up. Where does Warrington go? Do you think he would have to fight Lara again? Or do you think he can move on and ignore Lara, pretend he doesn't exist, and people would sort of forgive him for it? <sighs> yeah, I don't know. He'd, he'd probably get a lot of stick if he didn't fight Lara again. There's a lot of unfinished business there, you know, like especially if he, if he picks up that belt. Um... Yeah, I would expect him to fight Lara, but, you know, there's obviously promoters behind the scenes, managers behind the scenes always try to look out for fighters and do what's best for them for the, the path of least resistance to try and keep that keep that money chain going with the big stadium, you know, attendance. And that doesn't last forever. So I'd imagine that they probably have a, a couple of fights in between, hopefully, and then... You know, because there, there are risky fights, aren't they? Even the, the Martinez fight's risky. I know he's beaten, but, you know, Lara uh, Warrington's coming off of those, uh, getting stopped and then looking in trouble again. And Kiko Martinez has, you know, pulled out <laughs> a resurgence. So that's a dangerous fight for him again. So uh, if, he, if he does win that, I'd expect him and his team to probably just, you know, uh, have a few lower lower tier fighters pro fights probably. I'd imagine. Well, let's see how that goes. That's also a division that's got a, an awful lot of interest behind it. Outmatch, I want to ask you about something else now. We'll move on to the next topic. Let me ask you about mm -hmm. Joseph Parker and this idea that he has uh, supposedly turned down the fight against Hergovic. We heard that Luis Ortiz did the same thing. Um, Michael Hunter had been accused of doing the same thing. And I was in a Twitter exchange where I said, look, in my humble opinion, there isn't enough money behind Hergovic. It is a risk versus reward situation here. Mm. And it's not just even a case of risk versus reward. These guys are prize fighters. They fight for a prize. And there were rumors that Hunter was only offered 400K. Hunter got involved in the Twitter exchange. He, he saw it somehow. And he uh, replied to say, actually, it was 233,000 that he was offered to fight Hergovic. Obviously, if you're going to be able to go down another route, and still earn a lot more money as a prize fighter, that might be where you're willing to go. So my question is, do you see it as a duck that these guys are not fighting Hergovic? Or do you understand that this is, uh, you know, a prize fighting situation whereby guys are going to want to fight for a financial incentive? Uh, to be honest, I'm kind of split down the middle. I don't want to be like an ultra diplomat. So I will say it is a duck. However, it comes with the caveat and the context of they're not fighting him because, you know, because he's a good fighter, because he's an underrated fighter and because nobody wants to stump up the money or a decent amount of money to fight him. So I can certainly understand it. 
um, why they wouldn't. But to be honest, I, I think it, it, it's, it's a risk reward thing, like anything is in life, I guess, where, you know, if you're that confident in yourself, surely you'd be like, you know, maybe now's the best time to get someone like a Hergovic who doesn't fight that often when he does fight it's against a complete pudding and you really want to get someone like that if you're one of his rivals before he gets any decent momentum because you know someone like Hergovic once he starts getting uh, starts getting uh, going and he's taking on better and better and better guys he's going to become a nightmare but yeah, it's it's a tricky one, you know. It's 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 easy for me to say it's a duck, but I'm not the one that's uh, got to put the gloves on and get in the ring. The but thing is, it's not a good look. Not good look. The thing is, as well, boxing on the edge. Um, Sauerland came out and he said the rankings have become a mockery. We have gone through the rankings before. This isn't about rejecting financial terms because fighters are rejecting us before we can even discuss that. They are rejecting the opportunity to fight for a world title. So, in other words, regardless of finances do you think that Hergovic has established himself now as the boogeyman of the heavyweight division and he's really in that who needs him club and people are literally afraid to fight him do you think that plays a role here um I think yeah definitely he's definitely a boogeyman um but pr prior to th this position he's in now it was he was always considered a, a high risk low reward right but there is actually a reward now because if he's, from my understanding, he's the uh, eliminator, right? The final eliminator. So the winner would fight for three belts. So that would be a high risk, high reward. Um, so, but yeah, he's he's a bit of a nightmare, really, to, stylistically. You know, he's got that amateur background. He's long, rangy, powerful. I can see why people avoid him, to be honest. You know, again, it's probably not always the fighters. They, they need protecting sometimes. And that's where managers... And promoters come in to try to steer them in the right path. Yeah, um, and that's the thing. When you speak about steering in the right path, you look at the WBA route, for instance. You've got Dubois supposedly fighting uh, Trevor Bryant next. And you look at that and you think, listen, Dubois, I think, is a terrific talent. Don't get me wrong. I think he's superb. I think he's, he's one of the future stars of the sport. Depending on that eye injury, you know, I don't know. We don't know how that will play out in the future. But in terms of ability, he's, he's a young heavyweight who's got the world ahead of him. Um, yeah. Having said that, you would look at that path and it looks like mm. an easier path than having to go down the, the Hergovic or right. Joseph Parker sort of route, I yeah. would suggest. So you're right. When it comes to manufacturing a path, yeah. it seems to be happening, but it's nothing really new, is it? You look at no. David Hay, who was a terrific heavyweight. There were a lot of heavyweights who he didn't fight. You know, he didn't go down the uh, Chagayev and the Bragimov route, the, t the Tony Thompson route. He didn't fight Eddie Chambers. You know, he was fighting guys like Audley Harrison and Monty Barrett. So it's nothing new. Ruiz came out of retirement and he fought him. Outmatch, yeah. do you, do you, uh, how do you judge a heavyweight that sort of looks, seeks to fight a lot of C-rate guys, then jump in for a world title? It seems to be happening far too often. It seems to be happening a little bit in the lightweight division as well. There seems to be a lot of guys who aren't, they seem to not be willing to fight each other. Do you think it, it damages the reputation of the fighter? Or do you think as long as he then wins that world title, all then becomes forgotten? Um, oh, to be honest, I think it's something personally I'd like to take on a case-by-case -case basis. But in the situation of, okay, we've got a guy who hasn't really fought anyone and he jumps straight into the deep end. And look, it's admirable. But for me, if he, if he loses, you have to say, look, all right, it was a miscalculation get on the comeback trail and now start to have your development fights. Kind of what, like what we saw with uh, Anthony Yard. Um, but if he goes, if he takes that leap, jumps into the deep end and wins, it's obviously, it's great, you know, thumbs up. But for me, it's like the form that comes afterwards matters more because, you know, sometimes we've seen fights who jump up and then they, they win a title, they take on a champion and then they go back down to fighting what, uh, opposition that's you know a league below maybe two leagues below and so for me I'd say what's pivotal is what comes afterwards I want to say that's the key for me Boxing on the Edge do you feel that Hergovic is a guy who if he does finally get an opportunity he will be the one to dethrone one of the current champions or do you think although he's the boogeyman there is a ceiling there 
I think I think he could, you know, stylistically, as I was saying, I think he could absolutely be a nightmare for most. And actually, stylistically, speaking of Joseph Parker, I think he poses a, a bigger stylistical threat to him, which might be why, you know, they've chosen to basically swerve him. But yeah, I think he, I think he could be a problem. And that's probably the reason why people haven't been trying to get in there with him. He's a funny dude as well. Like, you know, this whole beef between him and Babbage is quite funny. But um, yeah, I, I, I really want to see him fight a, a top guy, to be honest, because I, I think we're really dying to find out how good he really is. Well, he does you know? have that loss in the amateurs against Joe Joyce. I'm sure someone like right. Joe Joyce would jump at the chance. The point is, he's he's a very good fighter. We know that, mm -hmm. obviously. He's not this uh, invincible dude that people are making out, in my humble opinion. It does seem to be a risk versus reward situation for me. And that's why I personally believe they're going to have to make some sort of investment to try and lure guys in, financial investment. You may make a couple of losses on these first couple of shows, but if he does go and knock out, imagine he was to knock out a guy like Joseph Parker, um, mm. it suddenly catapults him into another stratosphere. You know, it's one thing for people to say, this guy is, you know, because regardless of what you say, if you look at his his CV, some of his earlier fights were actually bigger tests in theory than some of his more recent fights, but none of them have been top level opposition. I mean, there are some recognizable names there. You've got Eric Molina, you've got Kevin Johnson, who's way past his best, Amir Mansour, way past his best, but their names people know. If he goes and batters a guy like Joseph Parker for argument's sake, and I'm not saying he would, but I'm saying yeah. if he was to, all of a sudden he becomes more of a cash cow. And I just think that they're going to have to invest in him and really believe in him um, and see if he can deliver. One of the methods in which you can do that, of course, you've touched upon it already, is if you have some sort of fight in Croatia where the build-up would be superb between Babic and Hergovic. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't give Babic much of a chance, to be honest with you. <laughs> no. But the build-up would be brilliant. And I just yeah. feel as though it's one of those situations where they're just going to have to invest in him. Um, but the heavyweight division is, is so exciting, generally speaking, for me, I think it's stacked. So final question I want to ask both of you guys, in terms of the heavyweight division, do you see it as a golden era that's just waiting to sort of explode? Or do you really just see there's two or three guys up there and whoever comes out on top, that's that, basically? Outmatch. Um, for me, absolutely, it's a golden age. And I think any objective person will see it is. To be honest, all we have to do is look at the records of the, the fighters in, what, the top 20? And maybe the top 15, maybe top 20 is generous. But there are so many exciting matchups. And you look at the top guys, they've traded losses, they've traded draws. You know, uh, Joshua beat Andy, Ru Andy Ruiz. Andy Ruiz lost to Joseph Parker. Joseph Parker lost to Joshua. Like, that's only the tip of the iceberg. And the only thing that's missing is a lot of these fights aren't happening because there's immediate rematches, there's bogus uh, sanctioning bodies that don't want to call fights, you know. And it's a shame because, in my opinion, this is absolutely a golden uh, era of heavyweight boxing. And I just encourage people to appreciate it and appreciate these fighters while they're here. Boxing on the edge? I think it's a golden era in terms of talent, but not in terms of like a golden era is when everybody fights each other you know that that to me it would define a golden era until you get all these guys in the ring with each other then then yeah that's what i meant though about is it a golden era that's ready to explode in other words right. it just needs it just needs you know a little fire a little flame and all yeah of a sudden, i mean potentially then yeah we'll say it has the potential to be an enormous golden era for sure but these guys not just them it's the promoters too and everything else going along with it but we want to see the best fight the best, or at least, you know, majority of them get in there and fight. And there's, a, there's sometimes there's no reason why they're not. And it's frustrating, but we want to find out how good they are. They should find, they, they should want to find out how good they are and put their skills to the test. Well, let's hope know? 2022 brings about some yeah. fantastic fights we all want to see. There's just under three minutes left of our little Zoom call. So if you both just want to give your plugs as to where people can reach you on social media or on youtube we'll start off with boxing on the edge yeah um i've got a twitter boxing on the edge um just getting going with that just trying to figure out how to use twitter so and then boxing on the edge 11 on the instagram and then youtube i've got a youtube channel which is a lot of boxing technique but i've just started doing some fight breakdowns and i've got a few other bits and pieces in the pipeline too so a lot of stuff coming up 2022 so yeah outmatch out. 
Uh, yep, Outmatch Boxing. I'm only on YouTube, so one place you can find me. Uh, do film studies, previews, reviews, breakdowns. I like to do good technical, tactical uh, breakdowns, especially from a, a technical and a biomechanical uh, perspective, especially. And uh, yeah, just, you know, chuck in some, chuck my hat into the ring based on my experience, my time in boxing. Uh, yeah, that's me. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me. It's been a pleasure to have you both on and it's been brilliant to hear both of your views. And thank you to everybody else that's tuned in as well. I hope you've enjoyed the, the show. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care and God bless. Thank you, brother. Thank you.